Hello, welcome back to Refractions. I am Stephen Mallon and thank you so much for joining us. I am so thrilled that we have Howard Greenberg with us today. So hello and thank you, Howard. Hello and thank you, Stephen. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for doing this. So um, there might be a couple of people that don't know you completely. And I also would love to hear a little bit about it. So can you tell us a little bit about how you got started in photography? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I'll try to keep it um, as short as possible, half hour, maybe an hour. Uh, <laughs> so I did not go to college for art or photography. Um, after college, I got a camera, however, and uh, I was, uh, for a few reasons, interested in maybe taking pictures. And um, once I, I, I got this camera because uh, a mother, my mother's um, uh, friend was going to Japan and asked me if I wanted something. So I got my Pentax Spotmatic. And I started taking pictures in 1970. And I decided not to go to graduate school in clinical psychology, and instead I photographed. And uh, I guess I, you could say I became obsessive with photography. I sort of dropped everything else in my life to photograph and to learn photography, uh, which I did mostly on my own, a couple of classes and workshops here and there. But And um, so I moved up to Woodstock in 1972 and was able to get a job uh, as a photographer, staff photographer, you might say, for the Woodstock Times, uh, a publication which had just begun a few months before I arrived. And for uh, $15 a week, I was able to do all the photographs. I was uh, able and requested to develop film for the reporters and print their pictures and et cetera, et cetera. However, it, it was it was the best job I ever had in, in the sense that uh, it, it really introduced me to and allowed me, it kind of endeared me to the Woodstock artist community. It gave me a platform for um, publishing uh, my pictures and people seeing my pictures. And um, that's kind of how the photography, uh, being a photographer, started. Uh, I should say I, I, I set up a darkroom. I love darkroom work um, and da 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 da. At a certain point, um, I guess in 1976 or so, I, I did kind of a deep dive into the history of Woodstock, which is uh, an art colony that was founded in 1902 with a fabulous history. And also, um, a, a deeper dive into uh, the history of photography and had a idea or a vision desire to, uh, to, to, to start a photography center, a place where people, uh, especially the, my artist community could see what photography was really all about, um, which I didn't think they understood. And, um, you know, a gathering place for photographers and, and so on. So that's how the Photography Center uh, began. Uh, and I should acknowledge that I didn't do it alone. Um, I needed support somehow. And, and I was introduced to another photographer, actually a student of mine, White's, who was in the area. I had seen his pictures, uh, but I didn't, hadn't met him. We were put together and... Uh, we started the photography center together. His name was Michael Feinberg. And he stayed for a while, not that long, and eventually moved to Hawaii, where he today. But uh, uh, together, we were able to get the photography center going. And um, uh, it was great. You know, it was wonderful. And the only problem was uh, making a living, <laughs> you know. Uh, I mean, I taught a class at the photography center. I, I worked in the post office on Saturdays. I did a lot of uh, photographing of artwork for the artists and, and so on and so forth. Um, but my interest in the history kind of advanced. And, and with that, I, I became a, um, uh, how should I say, Lyle Rexa once wrote an essay for my 25th anniversary book, and he called me a hunter and gatherer. And, and I always felt that was exactly what I was. You know, I would 
hunt down old photographs and then gather them up as best I could. And um, and that interested me more than anything. So three, four years after I founded the Photography Center uh, in 1981, I opened my first commercial gallery, which was right around the corner in, in Woodstock. And uh, I called it Photo Find. And I was off and running, <laughs> you know, as, as a photo gallery and, and dealer. And um, you might say the rest is history. <laughs> Almost. There's, <laughs> a, there's a couple of decades of stories in there, but that's uh, yeah. That's, that's pretty much how it started, though, in the beginning. You know, I, I really, um, I, I'm sure everybody listening uh, today understands that uh, photography. I mean, you know, it's a very special medium. No, no matter what part of it you're involved with, it's also a bit of a trap. I, I, I don't know. I mean, for me, especially. Again, you know, in the analog days, you put a piece of paper in, in the developer and, and boom, there's a photograph. That's magic, you know, and and that grabbed me and I never looked back. It's so easy to fall in love with photography and all that it's about, you know. So I think that's how I was able to say sustain the last, yeah, almost 50 years now. That's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Who were some of the first photographers that you showed at the gallery? Well, the very first show at the Photography Center in 1977, I think was notable because, um, I, well, I, I had a couple of contacts who owned uh, the Walker Evans, I've, uh, uh, Double Elephant Portfolio, and a copy of uh, Paul Strand's Mexican Portfolio. And they're kind of famous uh, publications from the past, if you will. And the way we designed the center at first, which was the upstairs part of that building in Woodstock, uh, you could have two separate shows in, in the same space. And I put both of those up. And truly, uh, the photography community flocked from all over because you had to go to New York to see that work previously. And, and it was you know few and far between the shows in New York that would have Paul Strand and Walker Evans. And so uh, it was a great, great start to, to the center. Um, with my own gallery in 1981, I think I did a show, I think I did a show called something like This is Photo Find, you know, which was a sort of introduction. Wait a second. That was the first show I did in New York in 1986 when I moved the gallery. First show in Woodstock. Oh, God, I really think it was Alfred Stieglitz. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. And it was a combination of camera work reviewers and prints. Um, my close friend, the sort of right-hand person in the beginning of the gallery, a man named Ben Coswell, his girlfriend was uh, Ellen uh, Lowe. And Ellen's mother was Stieglitz's grand niece. <laughs> and through that connection, I was able to, you know, consign a lot of great photographs by Stieglitz. <laughs> That's and um, and so I was able to do that as a first show. Yeah. Wow. Where was the first location in the city? Um, in the city, it was on. Uh, so this, uh, I used to in in the early '80s when once I started the business in Woodstock, I would have to travel all over the country, primarily to sell pictures. <laughs> Uh, it was interesting in those days, both acquiring, finding photographs, and then trying to sell them. Very different than today. Uh, in Woodstock, I, it was a base more to find pictures because there were so many interesting artists that lived there you know, for 100 years and connections to photographers. So there was great pickings in Woodstock. Um, but I'd have to take that on the road. And um, I traveled a few times, maybe three or four times with Larry Miller. Uh, Lawrence Miller Gallery. Okay. You know. okay. And, and uh, Larry and I, I, I don't even remember how we knew each other, but we go way, way back. And um, uh, Larry in 1986 took a floor in a building on Spring and Worcester, small building on the corner. I think it was 134 Spring, uh, maybe. And um, uh, I remember he, he called me and uh, said that he was afraid, that, as I recall, it was about 2,400 square feet. 
and he was afraid he couldn't pay the rent for the whole floor. And would I be interested in taking a third of it? And uh, that was at a perfect time for me to do it. My first wife and, and I had just divorced or just separated, I forget which. And I was now free to open a gallery in New York, which is where I was headed <laughs> at that point in time. So I did. I took tiny little space, uh, subletter from Larry for five years, and that was it. It opened in September of 1986. Wow. Yeah. And this has been such a <laughs> great time. <laughs> I know. I know. It was exciting. You know, photography, I, I don't think there were more than 10 photo galleries in New York at that point, maybe far fewer. I, and um, even then, even then, 15 years or a few more than 15 years after Witkin opened, maybe 15 years after Light opened, you know, the first real photo galleries in New York, 15 years a long time, but still it hadn't ignited yet. It really hadn't taken off anywhere near, you know, the way it did 10 years and more later. When was APAD founded, you know? Around in the early 80s, um, I forget exactly when, 83-ish, I think, 84, somewhere in there. Um, I should know that, but I, I don't. Uh, you know. How, you've, been, you've been a member for a while, though, right? Yeah, I, I was uh, invited, I guess you'd say, to be a member way back in the beginning. It wasn't the, wasn't the very beginning. It was after maybe two years or something of APAD. Um, again, there were not many photo dealers, even around the country. So I was in APAD and then I was on the board of directors early on, okay. you know, in the days with Harry Lund and Maggie Weston and all the, the great dealers from, from the get-go. And uh, yeah, that's when it started. QC, Mark Hughes Pfeiffer, if anybody out there remembers her, QC Pfeiffer. Uh, was one of the really fine uh, early New York galleries. And, and she was the president of APAD for a while and really pushed it forward with some, with great ideas. You know, APAD in those days, we were, uh, we were on a mission, you know, and, and we wanted to both educate the public and also have a real, um, uh, how should I say, professional association with help for insurance and shipping and all these issues uh, that that uh, dealers would have, APED was going to come together and really deal with all that stuff. And uh, to an extent it did. We, we published a nice brochure for, you know, all those skeptical people out there who didn't know about photography and, and so on. And then it, things changed, you know, as time went on. And the uh, the fair, the APED once a year fair really became the focus of the organization. Do you do like now? Are you doing other fairs outside of APAD, or is that it? Do do does my gallery do? Yeah. Sure. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, we, we've cut back. I mean, a few. I'd say maybe about ten years ago or so, we were up to I think eight or nine different fairs a year. Wow. Really, and and you know what? It was debilitating. It was it was way too much. I, I don't know how. Certain art galleries do 20 fairs a year. They, they, it's incredible. But um, we cut way back, uh, even before COVID, uh, we cut back to, I think now we're doing four a year, maybe five. I forget exactly what. Yeah. So Periphoto, APAD. Periphoto, APAD, um, uh, Art Basel in a, in a couple of weeks, um, uh, ADAA. The Art Deal Association in New York, uh, and then last year we we came back to the Armory Fair. Okay, we, we had done that and then stopped a few years ago. We came back and did it last year. This year we may be doing the new Photo Fair that's going to be in September in New York. Yep. Yeah, we're still. I mean, we're signed up for it. I'm still not 100 percent sure we're doing it. <laughs> it to be continued in that story, but um, uh, yeah. So what's that? Five, I think. But yeah, I think that's the math. Yeah, five. <laughs> I yeah. lost track. It's it's enough. I mean, we did Miami Basel for years. Uh, we stopped doing that. We did Photo London for a bunch of years. We stopped doing that. 
So, you know, it was more. How are you feeling about Miami? Are you going to go back? You know, I love doing Miami because I had a place there and I'd go down for 10 days. I'd play a lot of golf <laughs> and, and really have a good time. And for quite a few years, it was great fare for us. We did really well. Um, and then it changed. The fare itself changed. The crowd changed. And uh, it just, we had a couple of years in a row where it just wasn't satisfactory. And Last year we did it, we, we put up a one-person William Klein booth, and, and I'll tell you, it was probably the best single display we ever did in an art fair. And I, and I felt, for, for educated reasons, uh, a Klein show uh, would work. It would be really uh, successful. And in the end, it was so much uh, head-knocking and tire-kicking and, and hemming and whoring. We sold, but it wasn't satisfactory. And I thought to myself, Miami's over for us. So that was it. Yeah. And when was that? Hmm. Five years ago? Five years. Something okay. like that. About yeah. that, yeah. What are some, like, I, I've always, you know, looked at Miami and my gallery has been there on and off and everything at different fairs and everything. And I, you know, it just, we talk about the money and I talk to everybody about the money, you know, cause the booths are incredibly expensive. And then you have to sell more than double of just the, you know, the booth to break oh, yeah. and everything. Like it's also a little bit of a long-term investment goal mm -hmm. about like seeing Absolutely. the collectors and the curators and everything because they may call six months nine months you know a year later because they remember seeing the work and they were just mm -hmm. waiting right i mean how like when do you sign you know like what's like a reasonable expectation i guess for for a gallery or for you at these art fairs like when do you feel like you need to know if it worked that's a good question i, I... I don't think it's possible to know if it's working the first year or two. You, you really have to go back to understand if it's going to work. And, and that's because, uh, you know, this is a business of relationships and, and, you know, people have to feel comfortable with you and, and it takes time. So, you know, if you're new in a city or new in a fair and people don't know you and stuff like that, it's going to be a couple of years of your showing up and having conversations and seeing what you have to get rolling. Uh, in general, it works that way. Uh, we, we've been fortunate over the years. There have been, I can't count on one hand, the number of fairs that we've done worse than breaking even, you know, or, I mean, maybe there's only been one or two. Usually we did very well at all the fairs that we did. Uh, for the past few years, it got tougher. I will say it did get tougher. Um, however, the other side of it is exactly what you mentioned. Uh, and these days, I think many galleries, especially smaller galleries, newer galleries, are happy to do a good art fair and lose money yeah. just for the exposure. You know, you can't expect to make money. Let me take, uh, well, any, any of the fairs, but let's say Parry Photo. Uh, and and Perry Photo, I have been there since the second year, and I've been involved in the committee for you know vetting applications and all that for many years. So I, I know a lot about Perry Photo, and um, it's interesting to see you know we get I don't know close to three hundred applications, and uh, so many of those galleries that apply are smaller galleries or galleries that. It, aren't even photography galleries. They're art galleries that maybe represent two photographers or something like that. And for them to break even with the cost of doing Parry Photo, especially if you're coming from another country, you know, with shipping costs and, and travel and expenses, all that can really add up. Uh, it's a pipe dream. You know, if you're selling... $50,000 photographs and you sell a whole bunch of them, okay, not so bad. But most galleries don't. Most photo galleries are selling work that's under $10,000. You can't sell enough pictures for under $10,000 to break even. <laughs> you know, you really can. It, it costs at an so international much. fair like that, at like Paris, yeah. London. So a lot of the success is measured by the fact that you're there. 
that you have access to the audience. And in the case of Parry Photo, the audience is the best in the world because you know curators, collectors come from everywhere, including America, even though it's in Europe. And certainly uh, European uh, museums and foundations and collectors are there in Paris. So it's worth it to spend a lot of money just to be in the fair, regardless of how much you sell. Yeah, yeah. I remember talking to a curator in, in Rome at one point and he was talking about how he goes to Miami, but, and he goes for like the week, but he only goes to the Art Basel fair. Like even with mm -hmm. all the other satellite fairs and everything, he just spends mm -hmm. like the entire, like every single day that he's there, he is just there seeing that work and that's it. And he's not, and I don't think well, that- it's voluminous. It's a big fair. There's not that much photography. Even the last year I did, I don't think there were more than four or five photo galleries in Art Basel. There were photo galleries and a couple spread out in a couple of the other fairs. But for art, you know, in general, you could spend three or four days in Art Basel and that's it. <laughs> art, art Basel, Miami, I mean, and, and that's enough. You don't have to go to the satellites. Yeah. If that's if that's the level of work and the price point and and the artist and like where they are in their career, that's where you're operating. Then it probably makes sense mm -hmm. not to mm -hmm. venture out too much. Yeah, yeah, I'm excited now about the fact that uh, the Armory and the Photo Fair are going to be both on you know in Javits at the same time. Mm -hmm. Like I just, yeah, I mean it's going to be overwhelming, but at the same time, I think there's going to be a lot of like spillover between the crowds. Let, let me ask you this. As, as a photo person, do you think that the photo fair will be successful? Do you think that photo people will really come out and go to the photo fair? Or will they come out and go to the armory and, and maybe go to the photo fair? I mean, what's your sense of it? I mean, the photo collectors are definitely going to go to the photo fair. Right? You would hope. Yeah. I mean, I'll, you know, we'll go in probably for the two days. And I would think that the first day is that we're going to hit the photo first. And, you know, depending on how much work and how many people are there, if I need to come back for the second day. Um, but yeah, I think it's going, I, I think it's going to work also because people are just going to want to see how it's set up because everyone is mm. curious. Everyone that got rejected is going to be yeah. curious everyone that didn't apply because they're nervous about the new fair um mm -hmm. you know even though they've got yeah, as yeah as i understand it there are not that many high profile galleries doing the fair the photo okay. fair um I, I i didn't consider that when i said yes early on i just considered that you know, even though we did well at the Armory last year, we're a photo gallery and it's a new photo fair, maybe more of our people will come there. That's all I was thinking. Um, lately, uh, the doubts come in because they really have not si signed up a lot of big name galleries. They're, you know, so I don't know what the quality of the fair is going to be like. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And because they... Is the fair like right? Because they're coming from Zurich or? No, it's a partnership between the Photo London people and the Shanghai Photo Fair. People. Shanghai, right. That was what it was. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I, I don't know that collector base at all. Like, so I don't know if people are, no, you right. know, in the art fair, like, oh, well, if you're running this, then we're going to come see it because you're connected. Like, mm -hmm. right. Is that enough of a draw right. for the collectors yeah. to get them in the door? And yeah. it's an experiment. We'll see. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I hope it works. It'd be, be nice if two fairs a year in New York. Yeah, you know, people come out after the summer. I think people will be, you know, hungry to go see art, go see photography, whatever. It's usually that way. So, are you still hunting and collecting and gathering for? <laughs> um, not like I used to. <laughs> Um, there are some practical issues. There's not so much out there anymore to hunt and gather and collect in the way that I used to do it. I mean, just so, so, so much of what uh, was or is great and interesting in the history of photography has already been flushed out. So 
much of it is in institutions, much of it is buried in collections, and much of it, uh, when it comes on this secondary market, as it does mostly through the auctions, it's very expensive. And, you know, it's been bought and sold once or twice or three times already. So the fun of hunting and gathering, you know, I, I couldn't even begin to tell you the amazing treasures that I've found over the years, found, quote, mm -hmm. uh, in some of the oddest places. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just, I mean, another time, you should just do a <laughs> webinar on that. The great <laughs> stories. You, you, you couldn't believe how it was in the old days, you know. <laughs> It's anyway, it's not like that anymore. I also, you know, I'm living here in Berlin. I do travel. I do get back to New York, but uh, it's it's not, it's just not nearly as easy. Also, I will tell you what is still out there to be discovered. And this certainly was some really wonderful photographers who are just now coming to light internationally, you know, from the past, especially post-war photographers, photojournalists, people like that. There's a whole bunch of them that were really good that seem to be getting discovered a little bit here and there. Um, but uh, what was I say? Be being here and uh, kind of, I, I like to think, it's not true, but I like to think I'm in a state of semi-retirement. I don't have a gallery in Berlin, you know, and I, and I don't have any of that. Um, it's not, it's just not as interesting anymore to put that kind of effort forward like I used to. Uh, the results aren't there. They just aren't. So um, I wouldn't say I've quit. Things still come my way. And, you know, when the phone rings or I get an interesting email, hmm, might be something, I'll go for it. You know? But, uh, you know, as far as me turning over stones and things like that, I'm not doing that anymore. No. If like, you know, 10 years ago or 20, you know, 20 years ago, like, would you open another gallery in Berlin or Europe? Or like, where where would you potentially open one? You know, ever since the, I started coming here, everyone I know has asked me, will you open a gallery? Uh, or did you open a gallery? Or things like that. Um, you know, it, it's an interesting question. On one hand, it's very, very easy for me to open a gallery in Berlin. First of all, the rents are, uh, I mean, I can get a very nice space for the same cost as the bathroom in, in, in <laughs> you know, in the Fuller building. <laughs> Truly, uh, it's very reasonable to have a space here. A. B, we certainly represent enough photographers and estates and have enough inventory that I wouldn't have to worry about material for good shows. <laughs> And see, you know, I have a reputation. People know my name here in the photography world anyway. And so, you know, I could hit the ground running. Still want to. <laughs> <laughs> Simple as that. You know, the gallery in New York is hot enough to, to you know, keep it chugging along. And, and it's still in large galleries with a large staff and a lot of responsibilities. And, uh, you know, to muddy the waters by opening one here, it's it's not attractive to me. There's another side to it also. Berlin, as great a city as it is for art, and it's really wonderful. There's just so much going on here. And, and there's lots going on in photography also. It's still not a great place for selling. There are really not many serious collectors of photography in Berlin, or even of art for that matter. There's a few, but there's not many. And all the dealers who are here, the Berliners, will tell you that with emphasis, uh, the good galleries in Berlin tend to do a lot of art fairs. They have to, you gotta get out of town. Uh, some say the situation's improving, they have photo week, they have art week. It's kind of like an art fair, except you might call it an outdoor art fair where people come in from out of town and really visit a lot of galleries during that week or weekend. And that helps business a lot here, but just day-to-day -day business and selling in Berlin proper is not, not as much of it as, as you would hope, not at all. So that's another reason why it's, it's just not attractive to me to open a gallery here. Is that different in like London? or Paris? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I think there's more potential for more collectors, more institutional activity, blah, blah, in London and Paris, yeah. Okay. 
Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. And unfortunate, because I love Berlin. We, we, oh, it's great. And there are good reasons for it. First of all, there, there are a lot of really good German artists and, and Berliners. Uh, I mean, you wouldn't believe there's thousands of artists here, you know, and um, uh, it's a great place for discovery. It's a great place, uh, you know, for sort of getting your act together as an art gallery and as an artist. Uh, and uh, it's like a staging grounds. That's how I see it. And it's very viable as such. But I also think it's very provincial. <laughs> and, you know, you, if you look at the galleries, it's almost entirely German artists, German photographers that are being shown, which again is fine, but there's no largesse to the scene. It's really, as I say, provincial. And uh, if you're the kind of gallery where you do do a lot of art fairs and you know your gallery is just a place to begin it and then you take it out to the world, then it works fine. And I have some friends who, who do it that way. But if it's just here, it's a quiet business. It's going to be a stretch to like really make it into something big based just from Berlin sales. Yeah. Yeah. I heard that a little bit about Miami as well. That like Miami is an absolutely fantastic city one week out of the year. Mm -hmm. It's like when all the galleries are in town, like when the art fairs are happening, it's just absolutely mm -hmm. fantastic. It's super cultural, a lot of fun and everything. And then mm -hmm. they leave and then it just like flat. It's really quiet. That's true. Yeah. Um, again, Miami's, I think it's, I think it's similar. There are, you know, a good handful of very high profile collectors in Miami, great collectors, uh, and they all open up foundation spaces and everybody knows them uh, by and large. Uh, but yeah, you know, when, when the fair is not around and the international scene is around and the, you know, hyperactivity is gone, people stop. I, th I think probably the serious collectors then go to New York for the art fairs <laughs> or maybe uh, London or, or Art Basel or whatever. Um, yeah, it changes in a similar way. Yeah. How? As artists, like you're, I mean, your artists are all, you know, the the contemporary ones that are still alive, right? You know, at the MoMA met, you know, international museum level and everything. But like for some of the smaller up and coming artists, like how much responsibility do you think lies on the artist to like get into those museums or, or versus the galleries? Does that question make sense? Well, yeah, sure. I mean, um... Look, every artist wants their work in museums, right? I don't think it gets any better than that. Uh, to have a museum acquire one way or another your work and hopefully put it on the wall at some point, that's, every artist should, wants that. Um, sometimes a gallery is a vehicle to that. Sometimes the artists themselves do it themselves. <laughs> you know, it, it depends on the personality of the artist, really. Uh, and um, some artists are, are fortunate enough for one reason or another that it just sort of takes off on its own. They do their work, someone sees it, they do something, someone else sees it, a writer writes about it, you know, museum uh, buys a printer. It, it can happen any which way. Uh, I feel that uh, photographers who have that sort of outgoing personality and are not shy to get their work around, be it to galleries or museums or, or both, is, as long as they do it in a, how should I say, in a pleasant way. Actual. <laughs> they're, they're best off. You really, I mean, I've noticed over the years that uh, photographers who might be very good photographers, unless they have a gallery really pushing for them, if they're quiet personally, they're not getting the work out there. Well, nothing ever happens, you know? And then I've seen photographers who have had brilliant careers because they were pounding on doors constantly <laughs> with their work and getting people to listen because the work was good enough, you know? Um, yeah, <laughs> there's no magic formula. <laughs> yeah. 
to all this. And there's also no guarantee that if you're with a gallery, any gallery, even if they show your work and, and try and get pins sold and all that, there's no guarantee of anything. You know, it, it, the only thing I could say is it's better if either you as an artist or your gallery or both of you are, you know, out there promoting yourself, uh, but uh, better than not, there's no guarantee what's going to happen. You know, if, if the world is going to love your work or not. You just need a couple. Yeah, I mean, I, I even with history, it's always been a source of frustration to me because I work with some really great, not so well-known photographers or estates of photographers that I felt were they were really great. And I've seen how difficult it is to market their work. And even when it was successful selling prints to collectors and museums, where the way it goes over a period of years with with prices and interest and things like that and then you compare that with you know certain other photographers who you know sometimes in my estimation they may be good they may be even significant but just you know no better than some of these others and, and then you see crazy prices crazy uh uh you know, auction records, crazy desire on, on, on the part of the buying public just because it's, you know, somehow those photographers or that photographer has been put in their head. It, it, sometimes it really doesn't make sense and it's really not fair. Uh, and you see that over and over. I see it over and over. But, you know, that's the art world. It, it just is like that. You know? I've always, you know, kind of talked about not being that flash in the pan, you know, it's like you want the steady climb and not the, you know, that sudden spike and then it just crashes because, yeah. you know. You that know. happens a lot in, in photography because it's photography. It's a, you know, it's a, a medium of multiples. And um, I've seen a lot of photographers over the years, great classic photographers, you know, their the prices just went well, up and up and up for a long time. And then suddenly the world was saturated <laughs> with their photographs. And also suddenly interest changed and people were moving on because they already had this photographer, that photographer in their collections. And then I seen prices for great, great photographers, you know, just come down, 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 down. <laughs> you know, it's really interesting. Uh, so, sometimes in perspective of all these years, I have to say, well, it's a market. <laughs> It's become a market like any other market. Prices can go up and prices can go down. And that happens with fads, that happens with surprises, that happens with big exhibitions or lack of exhibitions. You know, all, all these factors uh, weigh in, but uh, that's the way it is now. It was great in the, in the past. It looked like there was no end in sight. <laughs> you know, I'd say that the first 20, even 25 years that, that I was, I've been doing this, it only went up. And sometimes it went up in ways that was, you know, startling how expensive photography got. You know, in, in retrospect, maybe it went up too fast. <laughs> that steady <laughs> climb got a little bit out of control. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Where do you like the additions? Like quantity and size and everything. Like, do you do you, do you have a preference? Do you like it, you know? one way or the other? Well, whether I like it or not, it's not the point. Editions are, are uh, the only way that the greater art world has accepted photography as, as something to purchase, something of value. These days, for a long time, for many reasons, uh, most people cannot accept the idea of unlimited amounts of a photograph, you know, photography just keeps printing it, or even more, oh, this edition sold out, we'll just make it another edition in another size. This was the way it was for many years. Nobody questioned it. But in, uh, according to a lot of recent developments, when I say recent, over the last 20 or so years, um, it became clearer and clearer to everybody that in order to keep the value of photographs at a certain high level, 
you had to have additions. And, and additions over the last 20 or so years have become smaller and smaller. And now in, in, in very recent years, there's pressure to only have one size. If you're a young photographer and, and you're having your first show and you want to know what should I do about additions, my advice at this point is bite the bullet, do a small addition in one size, or sometimes an exception, okay, a smaller addition in a very large size, <laughs> because some people want that. Um, that's what the, the market demands now. You know, that's just simply the way it is. Uh, look, digital printing has a lot to do with it, because you know once, once you get your print the way you want it, Digitally, it's very easy to reproduce exactly. The only change is if you want to change your paper, it might look a little different, but you can get the exact same print. In the past, you couldn't quite do that. I mean, great printers might, you know, do uh, 40 prints for Andre Cortez or Shea Mangian, and, and they'll all look the same. But, you know, before that, they all look different. And, and, you know, it's not it's not a one to one thing in the old days of analog photography, but now I think uh, photographers have to be uh, just much more cautious about what they put out, how many, and all that, and that's where additions come in. It's all changed. So I'm not forward against it. It's just it's reality. Yeah. Just the reality of the market. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I remember Frank Moresco was looking at the work once and he just, you know, he said that there's just like, there's only one size that this work should be shown at. You know, it just like, it's just, just big. And it's like, yeah, I don't, I, I don't, I don't agree with that. But uh, some people really feel strongly about the one size, <laughs> you know, and, and, and that's it. Yeah. I don't know. I, I'm still, uh, as I'm sure you are, a bit old world with, with photography. You know, there is no one size. You know, sometimes it looks good, small. Sometimes it looks big. Sometimes the difference between small and large uh, is is an understandable difference. And large is great in a certain place and you know situation, and small is great. So why why not have both? You know, it's photograph. <laughs> it's a debate. <laughs> Oh, well, that has gone incredibly fast. We're already kind of like towards the end, and I feel like we could keep talking. It's already really? been 45 minutes. Really? <laughs> Steve, you gave me a list of questions this big, and we've gotten to this. You know? I think we got through a lot of it. But Yeah, yeah. did we? Yeah. Okay, good. Because um, we talked about the gallery. We talked about iPad. Um, we talked a little bit about your your hunt you know i um in your collection you don't want to open a gallery in berlin that's good um i guess you know one thing we can talk about a little bit more is the um you're coming back to cpw's new space mm -hmm. um they're giving you an award right they are they are um, very exciting it's 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 an embarrassing award <laughs> because it's called lifetime achievement <laughs> It's not as embarrassing when I got a Lifetime Achievement Award, I don't know, 10 or so years ago from the George Eastman House. At that point, I was it was more than 10 years ago. I was much younger, and I didn't really feel like my lifetime <laughs> <laughs> had come to the point of having an Achievement Award. I'm a little closer now. But uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's very nice. Look, it's very nice. I'm... I'm delighted uh, about this new new kind of unexpected chapter of the photography center's <clears throat> life. You know, it's been more than 45 years now. It's a long time for a nonprofit, for a small nonprofit to exist, yet here it is kicking it up, you know, tenfold. And um, we don't know what the future is going to be, but it's exciting. So, uh, you know, I'll, I'll be there and and get this award and, and that'll be wonderful. And I'll have some friends there and it, it'll be nice to, to say something about the transition and about the past and about the future. And, uh, you know, if, if I'm 
in certain way the link or, or can be the link at least for that evening and that award i'm very happy to you know to be that person uh, it's actually quite gratifying in that sense. But when, when I hear lifetime achievement, it gives me a little bit. <laughs> you know? Hold on, hold on, I'm still here. <laughs> it's funny. But yeah, that's coming up. And can I do a plug for the center? Please do. We are fundraising. <laughs> I mean, it's it's we have acquired this building. It used to be a cigar factory in, in Kingston at a time when Kingston was a really important city in New York because it was on the Hudson and all the commerce, you know, uh, everything was shipped up and down the Hudson. And uh, it was abandoned for, I don't know how many years. Uh, and if you look inside it, it kind of reminds you of a Lewis Hine photograph, you know, of, of an industrial space. You could almost see the kids there rolling cigars. Um, and it's a big challenge. Uh, the state has been very kind. They, they really helped us uh, with financing the purchase of the building, but now we have to fix up the building and make something great out of it. So we're in fundraising mode, and I just want to put that out there. For those of you who know the center, right now it's a good time to support it in any which way you can. So I've, I've, I've done my, my bid for the center right <laughs> here and now. Okay, I'll do it again next week. <laughs> Well, congratulations on the award. Congratulations on the center in general, because I do, it is like the next generation, you know, it is opening this much larger space. And I think just that the, the potential and the capability, it's going to be wonderful to, to see it. And like you were, we were talking before we started recording, just that it's going to be, you know, a potential like cultural hub in Hudson Valley. And I love the fact that it's a photo center, you know, that it's. Yeah, you know, that's true. That's something spectacular. So Howard Greenberg, thank you so much for your time. This was an absolute treat. And uh, yeah, just looking forward to hearing the stories. And, you know, you're not opening a gallery in Berlin. We understand. No pressure. Um, <laughs> okay. Well, but, thank you, Stephen. My pleasure. Um, I love to talk about it all. So anytime. <laughs> awesome. All right. Hopefully we'll be able to have you back. All right, great. Thank you All again. Right. Thank you, everybody. That was fantastic. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. And I think we can sign off.